Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia for another episode of Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts. In this story, we are asking the question, was Jack the Ripper Frederick Deeming? We've spoken about serial killers on this channel before. We've had an episode on Thomas Jeffries, John Lynch and Alexander Pierce the Cannibal. However, one man had links to Jack the Ripper. His name was Frederick Bailey Deeming. He was not only a suspect in the Ripper murders, but boasted to know who Jack the Ripper was, and he had intimate details of his crimes. But he also actually claimed to be Ripper himself while in jail toward the end. Jack the Ripper has never been identified and there have been many suspects and accusations. Everybody has had an opinion on who they think it was. Even a descendant of a known serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes, states he believed his ancestor was Ripper. H.H. H. Holmes was a ghastly man who even set up his house to cater for his horrific crimes. There are many similarities between H.H. H. Holmes and Frederick Deeming. They were both swindlers, fraudsters, killers of those close to them. They both changed their name to mask their identities and both moved around England in 1888. But let's concentrate on Frederick Deeming, as he murdered right here in Australia. We go back as early as we can to Fred's origins to work out where he went bad. Frederick Bailey Deeming was born on the 30th of July in 1853 in the Leicester town of Ashby. It was believed his father, Thomas Deeming, would savagely beat Fred and his older seven siblings, which drove Frederick mad himself. His father, Thomas, died from insanity in a workhouse after many attempts to commit suicide by cutting his own throat. Their father believed that their home was haunted and would often hear voices. One of Frederick's brothers, Edward, declared in a sworn affidavit that their father was a most passionate man and when out of temper had no control over himself. Frederick was never a favourite of my father's. He seemed to have taken a disliking to him from birth. And Frederick's mother was too quite mad. She was a Sunday school teacher and quite religious, a little bit over the top, you would say, making all the children God-fearing, but perhaps too far when it came to Frederick as he became obsessed with the concepts of sin and punishment for those who were not pure or as religious as he and his mother had been. Frederick was said to be a difficult child, that he claimed he was in and out of asylums as a child, as had his parents. He says also that he had epilepsy from 18. His brother Albert has denied this, but was it true? Perhaps the brother Albert was trying to hide their not-so-great childhood. Or perhaps Frederick was just mad. Others state that he had respectable parents and that Frederick ran away to sea at 16 in 1869. He also says that while he was at sea, he got brain fever and was never quite the same again. In 1873, it is said that his mother Anne died and Frederick became quite distraught, remaining this way for some time. This may have also began his life of crime. Now that mother had passed, as too had father, he could live his own way. Or could he? He stated later on that his mother visited him from the afterlife, still dictating his actions. But we will learn a bit more about that later. It was believed he ran away to sea due to his father's beating. They named him Mad Fred, as his eccentric behaviour would increase as he got older. And whenever he returned to the family's home, he seemed to get a little more crazier. They said that he dressed in expensive jewellery and informal clothing, like he was attending a funeral. 
they'd often hear him talking loudly to himself and once claimed to have seen his mother's ghost floating outside the window after her death. It is believed that despite the behaviour, he spent several months in a Calcutta hospital, suffering dozens of epileptic seizures in 1878. Shortly after, though, he's back abroad, sailing between countries. It seemed that he would sail between England and South Africa a lot. This is possibly where he spent his money and bought lavish items. Shortly after, in 1881, he comes across a Marie James, a Welsh woman, on his travels. On the 28th of February, 1881, in Cheshire, he married Marie James. It was known in the August of 1881 that he deserted the Verus, which was the ship that he was meant to be sailing on, in Sydney. Now, it is believed that he gained two trades as a plumber and gas fitter. This was about the same time as another plumber in England named Thomas Crapper was coming up with a variation of an earlier version of the toilet, which had been designed by Queen Elizabeth I's godson, John Harrington, which he'd named the John. Thomas Crapper's redesign of the toilet affectionately became known after World War I as the Crapper. Now back to Frederick, and he was getting into quite a bit of trouble being a plumber and gas fitter, but that he also stole from his clients, swindled and got into quite a lot of trouble despite his employers giving him raving reviews, stating that he was a hard-working man and really good at what he did. It's very strange that along the way in Frederick's life, there seems to be two sides to every story, a good and a bad. And in April 1882, was sentenced to six weeks jail for larceny of eight gas burners. Marie joined him in Sydney on the 1st of July, Two children are born, one at Roundtree Street in Balmain and the other at 162 Riley Street in Surrey Hill, Sydney. After working as a gas fitter in Melbourne and at Rockhampton in Queensland, he returned to Sydney in 1884, where he prospered briefly in business on his own. They went well for a while, deeming opening a gas fitting shop at 91 Phillips Street and bought a house in Vernon Street, Petersham. Then the shop was burned to the ground. Frederick Deeming sought the insurance money to cover his debts, but the insurance company must have found it to be an inside job, and they didn't pay Frederick the money. He spent 14 days in Darlinghurst Jail for giving false evidence at the bankruptcy court. The family didn't have a very good time in Sydney. Marie and the four kids were waiting at home while he spent most of his time in jail for defrauding, stealing, failing to pay bills. Once he came out of jail, he was becoming notorious for being a philanderer. He carried out affairs with several barmaids around Sydney, showering them with expensive jewellery that he'd stolen. He decided to adopt a new alias and took his family to South Africa where he starts a series of scams worth tens of thousands of pounds and also claims to have contracted syphilis from a prostitute. This may be where, apart from his mother's teaching, he has a real hatred of prostitutes and believes them to be evil. Whilst in South Africa, he's going by the name Harry Lawson and setting up deals. After he sets up these deals, we find him back in England again, as it's recorded as Marie and four kids back in England, where they stay from here in. I couldn't seem to find where Marie and the four children were staying. It's possible that they went back to where the family was in Birkenhead, Cheshire, where Marie and the four children would have been welcomed by his brothers and their families. During the year 1888, Frederick Deeming's whereabouts is quite scattered. There is evidence to show that he is in South Africa in the January, but in England 
at various parts in the later part of 1888, which coincides with Jack the Ripper and the murders. At least five murders were of a similar nature and linked to Jack the Ripper. At this stage, Frederick Deeming hasn't committed any crimes that we know of. But this is all about to change. Now, in 1889, Frederick Deeming is doing quite well. He is boasting to people with a lion cub by his side that he killed the lion's parents back in South Africa with his bare hands. Apart from meeting various women and throwing jewellery their way, he also plans to marry another woman in 1890. His dealings in South Africa must have been quite good as he was able to pay for a wedding in Beverly, Yorkshire with a Helen Matheson or Nellie Matheson as she also went by in the February of 1890. What a strange man. Now he's married under the name Frederick Deeming so he uses the alias Harry Lawson to marry Nellie Matheson. They have a honeymoon in the south of England and when he returns Nellie to Yorkshire, he takes off with the presents that were given to them both at the wedding. How strange. Perhaps he cashes in the wedding presents and sells them and makes money. This might be why he's marrying all these women, as he never really sees Helen again. Some have said that the Matheson family and the James family found out about his bigamy, and this is why he took off. And we find that he's gone to another country altogether. He is arrested in Uruguay, where he is extradited and spent nine months in jail at Hull for fraud, but was not prosecuted for bigamy. After his release in July 1891, he stayed at Rainhill and inquired with a woman about a villa named Denham Villa. He wished to rent on behalf of his employer, a Colonel Brooks, arriving shortly from India. The colonel never showed up and, obviously, Frederick Deeming takes it upon himself to do a bit of work at the place. He meets Emily, the daughter of the lady showing him the place, but he is going by the name Albert Oliver Williams. Albert was actually Frederick's brother's name, but he uses it as an alias, secretly at Lancashire. At this point, it seems that he is done with Marie and the kids. He doesn't want them around anymore. He wants a new woman and a new life. He plans to marry Emily Maver and take her to Australia, away from Marie and the kids. Shortly before he plans to marry Emily, Marie turns up at Rainhill. Now, he explains to anyone who asks and questions him that Marie is his sister. It's her four kids. They are staying with him at Dinham Villa. Frederick organises for some tradespeople to do a bit of work on the Denham Villa. It is unclear at the time why, and he ends up having tradespeople, someone he knows from the area, come in and do the work. It is on September the 22nd, 1891, that they're married. He throws a lavish party at Rainhill before leaving with his bride for London, where he systematically defrauds various tradespeople prior to boarding the ship. And then they are off to Melbourne to escape everybody back home. Now, from here, the story becomes quite grim. The couple arrived in December when they arrived aboard the Kaiser William II. It is understood that he gets work in Melbourne as a plumber and they're not there long when he's already moving on. On January 12th, he joins a ship in Melbourne going to Sydney, but this time he's using the name Baron Swanston. And where is Emily as he travels alone and meets a Kate Rounsville, whom he starts courting and giving her quite a lot of attention. They don't know each other that well, and by the time they get to Sydney, it's quite late. Kate has to book into a hotel before taking off in the morning to go to her sister's in Bathurst. Now, he introduces himself to Kate as Baron Swanston, and he also checks into the same hotel as Kate, booked into the Wentworth Hotel, and they spent the night getting to know each other. 
where he tells her everything that she's ever dreamed of hearing and promises to marry her. He will be moving to Perth and would love it if she would join him later on. The next morning, after persuading her to miss the early train to Bathurst to spend some time at Coogee Beach, together that day they caught the train to Bathurst where he meets Kate Ransfell's sister and she is very impressed that he is so worldly and well-dressed. And Baron Swanston, what a name. He even took her out on a buggy ride. He proposes to Kate, and she accepts. He was going to take up a position as a mining engineer in Western Australia, and says once he is settled, he would send for her. And it wouldn't be until March 10th that Kate receives the telegram, Come at once. She left Bathurst on that afternoon, bound for Melbourne, where she would pick up a ship, sailing to Fremantle. In Melbourne, a family friend booked her into an overnight stay at the Federal Coffee Palace. Now this is a little pause in the story where we go to another area at the same time. March 3rd, 1892. A man named Mr Stafford is showing a cottage in Andrew Street, Windsor. It's been closed for a couple of weeks and there was a couple of renovations done. But the old tenant, Mr. Druin, had moved out. He was showing the property to another lady, eager to have someone stay in it again. She walked around the property, sticking her head around corners, having a good look at the place. And he opened the door and she walked in. Straight away, she was uncomfortable about the smell that was coming from the property. It wasn't a musty old home smell that they get after being closed for some time but it was pungent. It's very bad in here, she pointed out to one of the small bedrooms. Mr Stafford knew she would not be taking this cottage and she left shortly after. After she left, he went into that room. There was a fireplace in the room and he believed that the smell was coming from there. Could an animal have been trapped up the chimney flue? He did notice that the hearthstone was raised an inch or two and it is meant to be flush with the floor. He called on the letting agent. The last tenant, Mr. Druin, had paid a month's rent in advance and already moved out. He disappeared. Mr. Stafford, the landlord, told the agent about the hearthstone, and the agent came around. They managed to prise it up a few inches, and the stench was overwhelming. It was pretty obvious that there'd been a body buried under there. They called for the police at once. A young constable came in through the door, saw what it appeared to be, lurched the open window and vomited. Two Victorian detectives, a Sergeant William Considine and a Henry Causey, were assigned to the case. They dug up that hearthstone and it was a woman, about 30 years old, and she had had her throat cut. She had been buried for several weeks, but there was no sign of blood anywhere else in the house. Mr. Druin. This man had murdered his wife. Mr. Stafford stated to the detectives his name was Mr. Frederick Druin, but as he'd paid a month in advance, he didn't have any forwarding address. He just left. And was the woman even his wife? Mr. Stafford really didn't know anything about Mr. Druin. But luckily for the detectives, they found an invaluable little piece of evidence. A torn luggage ticket was found in the grate where the hearth had been cemented and clearly Mr. Druin or Frederick Deeming wasn't really that good at doing the cement job. A tradesman remembers Mr. Druin and gave a description of his appearance, being that he was very fair, a bearded medium height man with broad shoulders, probably in his mid-thirties. He wore a lot of jewellery and spoke in a North Country English accent. An ironmonger made the delivery to the cottage in Windsor. It was the cement, a spade and a trowel. The detectives investigated that torn luggage ticket right away. He'd arrived in Melbourne from United Kingdom on December 9th, 1891, off the Kaiser Wilhelm II, under the name of Albert Williams. He was accompanied by his wife, 
they interviewed many of the passengers they were able to locate who travelled with them. And they did remember Albert Williams. He had made himself conspicuous during the voyage, boasting of exploits in various parts of the world, antagonising ship officers with outlandish accusations of theft. Now, the detectives issued a warrant for the arrest of Albert William, alias Frederick Druin, for the suspected murder of his wife, Emily. It was a headline on almost every Melbourne newspaper. The Windsor tragedy, a woman buried in the home, beaten and her throat cut. It's actually found that she had axe wounds to her skull. It was a dreadful time. A shipping clerk called the police and said that a man with the description of Williams sailed from Melbourne to Fremantle on January 23rd, but using the name Baron Swanston. News of this went out as well. Police must have interviewed people on the Fremantle side and got hold of more information. Just before Kate Rouncefull gets to Melbourne, her sister Lizzie up in Bathurst receives a visit from their local police. They had a photo of Albert Williams, Frederick Deeming, Baron Swanston. She knew straight away and named him to police as Baron Swanston and immediately sent a telegram to Melbourne to catch Kate. It read, for God's sake, go no further. Kate thought it was really strange and wondered why there was no details of why. What could Elizabeth be trying to say to her? That evening, going out to get some air along Flinders Street, she bought a newspaper. The headline stated Windsor murderer arrested Williams alias Swanston at Southern Cross in WA. Kate collapsed. She had her answer. By now, enough people had come forward that the police were able to piece together who this man really was. Albert Williams was Frederick Bailey Deeming. And they had their man. Frederick was taken from Southern Cross to Perth. He boarded the train at Perth, which would go 563 kilometres to Albany. There he would meet a ship that would take him to Melbourne. The detectives were on board and would have had him pretty secure on the trips. At the country stations, crowds gathered and swore abuse. Lynch him, cement him as he passed. People all over Australia knew about it. And it got one Melbourne journalist thinking. The Melbourne Argus instructed their London representative to take a train to Rainhill and interview the murdered woman's mother, Mrs Mather. Poor Mrs Mather. She had no idea. She hadn't heard the news from Sydney yet. And unfortunately, it wasn't a really nice way for her to find out. But she cooperated with police in the area right away. She told of how he'd been staying at Denham Villa and that it was supposed to be for a Colonel Brooks, but he never came. His name was Albert Williams, who married her daughter, and that there were parties as well as some work that was done at Denham Villa. At once the police threw themselves at Denham Villa, checking the work that had been done by tradespeople and, of course, the fireplace where, unfortunately for poor Marie James, Frederick Deeming's first wife and their four children, the bodies were uncovered. So much for his sister and her four children staying there and then going back home. He'd murdered them so as that he could start a new life with Emily. It was disgusting behaviour. Frederick Bailey Deeming was a monster and the whole world knew now. As Frederick got closer and closer to Melbourne, each of the colonies was claiming their own Frederick Deeming story of fraud, theft, bigamy and links to Jack the Ripper. Now England had their stories too and accusations. It was all over the world. Could Frederick Deeming be Jack the Ripper? He was killing people just a couple of years afterwards, but he was in England in 1888, and could possibly, if he could kill his own wife and kids, have killed women of the night. He boarded the SS Ballarat and arrived in St Kilda Pier on April 1st, 1892. There were so many people gathered around, hurling insults. 
Heavily armed, mounted police were keeping the hundreds away. Off the SS Ballarat, he was ushered onto a police wagon and sent through to Melbourne City. People were th calling out things as the wagon went through the cities. Now, he was being represented by an Irish-born Marshal Lyle, who was eager to try and get him off the hook, stating that he was mentally ill. He spoke to Deeming at length about his family history of mental illness, his father, all those years ago, who was beating him senseless, and his mother, a frenetic religious woman. This, of course, was why Frederick Deeming was this way. Even Alfred Deacon, on the 22nd of April, moved for a postponement of the trial. Time was needed to help with Marshall Lyle getting this case together to get deeming off. Alfred Deacon would be the Prime Minister of Australia on three occasions later on. And some strange things occurred. It was said that Alfred Deacon was somewhat psychic, or that he had some kind of inkling about things, and his wife Patty was a medium. There were other people called in to try and get as much information about the supernatural as possible. Alfred Deacon and wife Patty were in cahoots with Sidney Dickinson and his wife Marion, who were believers of the occult as well as the spiritualism and things beyond the grave. Now it is believed that Marion held seances that Deacon and his wife Patty would have gone to. Now remember, Alfred Deacon is the second Prime Minister to Edmund Barton and would go on to be a Prime Minister again after that. So he seems to be pretty legit as far as the government's concerned. But his wife, Patty, could do automatic writing, channel spirits through her handwriting. Quite interesting. And definitely worth a mention because as part of the whole case, it is believed that Alfred Deacon turned to his friends, Sidney Dickinson, his wife Marion, and Alfred's wife, Patty, to help with this case. Because Frederick Deeming once again stated that his mother told him to do this. His mother, the fanatic, came to him often, and he heard voices like his father did. His house was haunted, remember, as a child. There were so many things in this case that they had to speak about in court, that they had to try and prove was a thing. Very strange indeed. The newspapers were making wild stories. They even suggested that Frederick Deeming was a vampire, as the bodies didn't have a lot of blood when they were found. <laughs> Quite interesting indeed. And even Albert, Frederick Deeming's brother, said that he had a dream about the time that his sister-in-law, Marie, Marie James, was murdered. He said that in the dream, she was murdered. So even his brother Albert is stating that he was having some kind of paranormal, supernatural things going on too. Wow, what a case. It's got everything. Vampires, Jack the Ripper, psychic abilities, prime ministers. Jeez, it's one of those stories. I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> now, at the trial... Alfred Deacon's request for the postponement was denied and the judge wanted to just get it over and done with. Justice Hodges. He was annoyed with all the hysteria surrounding the trial and he wanted it done and he felt that this disgusting human being, Frederick Bailey Deeming or Albert Williams or Baron Swanston, whatever he called himself, oh, and Harry Lawson, was guilty as hell and decided that he was going to go ahead, put Frederick Deeming on the stand. Frederick Deeming appeared subdued. His sparkle had gone. His quick wittedness and an answer for everything disappeared. I think by this stage he knew he was had. All different bits of evidence came to light. Unclaimed luggage at a railway station at Bairnsdale, a Victorian country town, had a trunk full of women's clothing. The key was found in Deeming's possession, and it had all of Emily's clothing. 
everything. They also found another trunk in England at Plymouth that contained blood-stained clothing of his children and toys, which was really terrible. All of this evidence mounted against him. He had no chance. Even with Alfred Deacon and his psychic abilities, they couldn't get him off. He was going to be hung. Deeming was given one last chance to say anything. He announced his desires and addressed the jury. He bitterly attacked the press. Go and pick out 200 people in Melbourne who would not execute me without option of a trial. If I had been a guilty man, I would gladly give a full statement of it rather than have submitted myself in this court for four days to gaze on the most ugly race of people I have ever faced in my life. Marshall Lyle told Deeming, even if you're reprieved for the murder of Emily Mather, you'll still have to go to England and face trial for your first wife and kids. Deeming replied to Marshall Lyle, in that case, I'd better get it over and done with here. Early on the morning of May 23rd in 1892, several thousand people lined the streets around Melbourne Jail. Inside the jail, 50 gentlemen, mostly doctors, journalists, in top hats, stood at the first floor landing where the rope dangled, awaiting the inevitable. Shortly after 10am, all hats were removed. Frederick Deeming stood upon the trapdoor, clean-shaven and arms pinioned. He gazed around blearily. The hangman, disguised by a large white false beard, stepped forward. The sheriff asked Frederick Deeming if he had any last words before he met his maker. Deeming mumbled what sounded like, Lord, receive my spirit, before the hangman dropped him to his death. As the witnesses filed out of the jail, a roar of approval went up from the crowd. They all dispersed in a matter of moments. Justice or vengeance had been seen through. It was a lengthy one, but with so many details and twists and turns, we had to have as much of this information included as possible. Well, Frederick Deeming. Now, it wasn't proven that he was Jack the Ripper, because Jack the Ripper hasn't been named, identified. But there's been a lot of speculation that perhaps Frederick Deeming, as mad as he really was, had killed the prostitutes. It was even said that a pair of surgical scissors had been put in for cleaning in London by Frederick Deeming. Many people had, who had met Frederick around the time of the Ripper murders stated that he had told them that he'd been the murderer or that he knew too much to be just curious about it. Either way, he was never formally identified as the Ripper, but many still believe, including a Scotland Yard detective at the time, that Frederick Bailey Deeming was Ripper. However, there are so many nasty people in this world, it could have been anybody at the time. And the links to surgical knowledge is something that really Deeming didn't have, but... Who says he was working alone? <laughs> now don't forget to like, subscribe and share and comment if you feel like it. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so you're aware when we're posting more stories.